Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, Cabinet Procurement and Sourcing Committee. Um, apologies, it says apologies from Councillor Coburn, although Councillor Coburn would say he's not a member anymore. He did say that. So, do you want to advise? Um, we haven't confirmed yet. Okay, so we're going to make his apologies. And, yes, we're going to set his uh, apologies. Councillor Williams as well. Uh, okay then? No, we're not noting. Oh, we're not noting. Because she's not technically replaced Councillor right, Coburn, okay. that's where we've got the We haven't noted the change to membership. All oh, right, okay, fine. Good sort that one. Okay, then. So, okay then. Um, we might need to conduct business in private at some point in the meeting, in which case um, we will indicate and we'll make the appropriate resolution and we'll ask the president to withdraw at that point. But at the moment, we'll proceed on the open agenda. Are there any declarations of interest to be declared by members? No. With no items of urgent business have been noted for by all deputations or petitions or questions. If we can look at the unrestricted minutes of the previous meeting on the 5th of February, um are we happy to agree that as uh, a true record yes chair agree uh we don't pay pages yet so and there's the action tracker attached to that which i don't think there's anything imminently due here now but just note that Noted. yeah yeah okay, then. thank you very much uh and then if we can move to uh item seven then the schools based health service city of hackney and I'm going to ask, I think, Caroline Sharp to introduce it. Yep. Yeah, okay, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Um, so, yes, my name is Caroline Sharp. I'm a consultant in public health. I lead children, young people, and the health protection portfolio. Yep, yeah, okay, sorry. I was going to ask you to use the mic, but there isn't one. There's that one in the centre. Sorry. Yes, yeah, no sorry. problem. Um, so, as you say, this is the request to approve um, a contract for the school-based health service, also known or more, more uh, commonly known as the school nursing service. So the maximum contract value is seven million three hundred thousand, excluding VAT over the full contract duration, which would be three years plus one plus one. So just by way of context, school nurses lead the five to 19 elements of the Healthy Child Programme, which is a national and evidence-based universal programme for giving every child the best start in life. Um, the contract also includes some nationally mandated elements, so the National Child Weight Man Measurement Programme, or NCMP, essentially measuring the weight and height of every child at reception and year six as well as safeguarding is also um, mandated, uh, supporting public health objectives and outcomes for school age children. So just in terms of the justification for why we've recommissioned this, um, essentially the service needed to be recommissioned as the contract had expired and there were no further extensions available to us. Um, so what we did was an ex extensive review of the current service, what was working well, what wasn't working well, um, extensive consultation with partners including schools themselves to get feedback both primary secondary and special schools uh, we did some comparative analysis work as well with other boroughs to see what was going well elsewhere and then um, uh, incorporate some of the good ideas locally and we also made sure we would we did a review of what our local needs were as well as national guidance and the evidence base as to what school nursing uh, modern school nursing should look like so we used that as an opportunity um, to design some of the challenges that was in the previous specification, design those out um, and try and align the contract and the scope with the national guidance because there were some changes to the national guidance that we wanted to, like I say, align our local services with. So just a couple of highlights in terms of things that we've tried to change, improvements we've tried to make with this service. So um, just for one more bit of context, it is a on a national scale, it's a challenging environment when it comes to school nursing. You know, the workforce is, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of vacancies within the workforce. It's, there's a lot of competition to uh, recruit school nurses. And um, we are finding that less new school nurses are coming through the system and our current school nurses are, uh, they're an aging cohort um, in, in short and so that's just some context that we're operating in it is quite challenging but we want to increase the capacity of our school nursing service to essentially do more than the 
key essentials, the safeguarding, the NCMP, the individual health care plans. We want them to be there in schools, speaking to teachers, speaking to parents, speaking to children um, about um, their health needs and championing what are solutions to the key drivers of poor health for that cohort. So things around sexual health, or oral health, um, healthy weight, immunizations, etc. And so we've tried to get more time in the in the contract to support students, teachers, parents and carers with those issues, to identify issues early and also to refer and signpost through established pathways to other services. Um, We've done. We've also done some work to essentially realign specific processes around individual healthcare plans and also safeguarding. Essentially, we were a bit of an outlier when we we did the comparative analysis work, and we weren't quite in line with what the national guidance is on those two areas. So we've realigned. That will reduce the burden on school nurses slightly, but like I say, it will increase their capacity to do those other elements of the school nursing role that are really, really important for giving every child the best starting life. A couple of other bits around enhanced service digitalization, again, all focusing on trying to increase capacity and get the school nurses in schools, supporting parents, teachers um, and uh, students. Uh, the last thing to mention is just that we're also aligning the service to deliver on a neighbourhood level, a neighbourhood footprint, as we had done with the enhanced health visiting service. Um, I know you wanted us to just talk quickly to the addendum that was submitted. Um, Joe, I think, is on the call and he can talk to that about the, the quality scores. Can I hand over to you, Joe, just to give an update? Thanks, Carolyn. Um, yes, just one thing I'd like to flag is the table in section 10 shows a total score of 74.2% and a quality score of 40.2%. Uh, this should actually be amended to show a total score of 70.2% and a quality score of 36.2%. Uh, but the price and the social value scores remain the same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, guys, thank you very much for your introduction as well. So, any questions or comments from members? Councillor Kennedy, and then the main. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, that overall, we're not reducing the spend here at all, are we? Despite all the pressures that we're under, um, and I think that's that's really important. It's flagged up in the report about how um, the need has got more complex and although actually the number of children in our school is going down their need for help from a service like this is going up and that's mm. essentially what um what's going on here at the moment it's really great to see things like um, that the uh, provider is providing e-bikes to their staff um and that you know we're we're saying how are you how are you addressing our uh, climate action plan um in all aspects of what we do and it's great to see um, that answered um, in uh, uh, the awarding of contracts like this. The one thing that um, is a bit of, it stems from that bit of casework that we've had, Carolyn, with the, um, with the garden school. Um, uh, but I know you've been having meetings um, and actually it was the inflexibility of the old model that was getting in our way there. And this new model is, is more flexible, but specifically for the minutes at 7.1.1 on page 25, we acknowledge that there is a need for sections of the NHS to step forward and provide support to children where this contract can't do it. Mm. Um, and I just want to check that we have a mechanism to make sure they do that. You know, how do we how do we hold um, our health system partners to account on that? Thank you, Chair. Um, so to come back on that point, um, well, I can comment on all of those. So absolutely nailed it around the spend. We're not reducing that because um, although numbers are going down, the complexity, and this was all the feedback that we were getting from um, schools and school nurses themselves, they felt that they, you know, didn't have the capacity to meet the full breadth of those needs. And, you know, each consultation when you've got somebody with complex needs in front of you can take quite a long time. And so we wanted to make sure that we were providing as much um, capacity as possible 
locally on something that we know is evidence-based for supporting children and young people. Um, yes, agree, the bid was particularly strong on the sustainability elements, um, one of the strongest that we've seen. Um, and with regards to the inflexibility, indeed, so previously there was a, pres there was a prescribed um, number of nurses for supporting children and young people in special schools, which um, meant that the school nursing service was always delivering that support where and often in the case where they actually weren't the appropriate healthcare professional to do so they don't have the training to um, often support children with really complex health needs and that's the role of um, the NHS and the children's community nursing teams within that so we have done an audit of the health needs of children in um, special schools we actually did it twice because it was done by an external um, partner and then our internal, our current provider redid it to, to triangulate and make sure that they agreed with the recommendations and the findings, which they did. And so we do have some clear recommendations now on who is the appropriate professional to be meeting these health needs. And there are conversations now with the NHS around making sure that that um, there isn't a commissioning or a providing provided gap essentially so we want it from the children and the special schools perspective to be seamless they they need to have the support there and there shouldn't be any breaking that continuity of care so those conversations are ongoing and we've got we you know the the nhs are at the conversations and they have the commitments there to providing that support and the, the commissioning support thank you okay Mayor Woodley? Uh, yeah, I suppose it was a wider question really around the neighbourhoods approach, which I welcome, you know, how that will tie in with some of the work around the children and family hubs and that sort of wider um, health integrated approach that we're trying to have, um, particularly around early years and the, and the primary schools. Um, and given the recruitment challenge, I suppose, whether there's been any sort of pan London discussion about how to incentivize this and, and build up that sort of workforce, because um, whilst I appreciate you're glad there's no savings being proposed, I feel like there should be an opportunity here to sort of have school nurses working across families of schools, um, you know, incentives to bring new people into the system, the, the, the need for nurses coming out of the pandemic and the, the various crises and the housing crisis is going to continue and the impact that has on health and sort of well-being um, isn't going away. So I'm just wondering if there's a, a broader strategic approach. I'm concerned that we're going to commit to that and, and we're committed then for well, three plus one plus one. Um, and we might not bring in a necessary kind of period of change um, to sort of boost it and secure it and improve it. Yeah, absolutely. So the neighbor, on the neighbourhoods configuration, um, so the idea is, because we were getting feedback from schools that um, because because of the workforce challenges and, you know, the, the, there, there is the there only is the capacity that there is in the service essentially that um it was difficult sometimes to always know exactly who your school nurse was or have that sort of direct relationship and it was a bit varied and so instead of having you know one school nurse allocated to a single school it's a team of it's a team within the school-based health service operating at a neighborhood level and so there's more cover um, and more support around that and that would align with what's happening with health visiting and like you say bring in other partners that are working um, or moving towards working in that neighborhood level so we know that we need to improve for example the link between school nurses and, and primary care and we think that working at that neighborhood configuration will facilitate that and conversations through our neighborhood steering groups have already started on that that area and um, and working sort of through the children's and family hubs as well is part of that so we see that as a real positive and a real strength to this new design um, and it was co-produced with other partners and they were all sort of really supportive on the recruitment so there's a few we're really aware of this challenge and there's a few things we've tried to do to mitigate the risk essentially so um we we aren't calling it a school bit a school nursing service on purpose it's because it's a school-based health service with school nurses leading but there will be appropriate skill mix within that team so it won't be school nurses doing everything and actually there'll be nursery nurses and other, it's not nursery nurses sorry but other other practitioners that are appropriately trained to support and deliver sort of a blended mix um, at a neighbourhood level. So that will be one mitigation. Um, 
the, the provider that we recommend awarding this contract to is doing a lot of work in this space as well. So they offer um, training placements, apprenticeships, um, and they've been really successful at bringing new school nurses through the training and then um, offering them roles within the service. I mean, it's not going to completely solve it, but it's, it, it helps, you know, a couple of, of new nurses coming through on a yearly basis. There is some work being done. I don't know if it's Pan London. I think it's more national actually looking at this because it's such a national crisis, the workforce challenge, um, being led by, um, I think it's SAPNA, the body. Um, I don't know about the incentives to bring new people into the system, if I'm honest, Mayor Woodley, um, but it's something that I can do to look into uh that 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 national piece of work is happening and i'm not as close to it as it i'm not that close to it but well well i can um find out who's leading it um and see what can be done um and if we can obviously pull some benefits from that work at a local level but there are a number of bits that we've considered around mitigating the risk especially around that blended mix and um selecting a provider that's actively promoting uh training opportunities and apprenticeships with service. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I've got two questions. And the first one is um, about uh, the, you know, the sustainable delivery sections through there. Um, and you, you say you're going to monitor it in, in, the, in the quarterly meetings. But um, I, I hope that, did you have any consideration of putting specific targets to, to the delivery of, the, of these items? Um, yeah. So, specific targets as in sort of KPIs? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, we don't do. Um, so, we usually set, so the, the KPIs will set beforehand and um, we don't sort of stipulate within the specification what the sustainability elements would look like. Yeah. So, it's part of the process. We ask the question and we score it but we don't prescribe what they should be essentially. Um, so it would be hard to set those targets, I suppose, a priori until we know. Um, I do think there is something though, like you say, about holding providers to account for what they've put in their bids. I don't know how well that happens everywhere, but I'm sure we can do more to, to do that. And so we, we can take the action to build that into, basically what we have is our, we have our KPIs, and that's this, uh, you know, yeah. a bit of quality. Well, set out in the back, aren't they? Yeah. But we can have in the narrative report a pre, preset section yeah. um, for delivery against sustainability objectives. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question, and someone will tell me if I'm, it's in the open bit of the report, so someone should advise me if I'm not supposed to ask this. But I noticed, um, and you've, you've revised it since I looked at it, that the quality um, part of the assessment is 36.2 out of a total of 70, isn't it? Yeah. I'm Which didn't seem enormously high. I wonder if there's, 65. 65. 65? Yeah, without 65. 65, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. A bit better, but still. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean. But still, it just uh, raised the question in my mind was whether, obviously, we're satisfied with it because you recommended it, but um, are there any particular risks or measures that you, 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 know, you, you, need, you should bring to the committee's attention, perhaps? I'm thinking about my answer. So, does it hide a problem? Let's just ask it in a straightforward way, you know. Do it, does it hide a problem? Is that what you're... So I, yeah, th I think... I think, no, I think on reflection, um, we there were multiple people in the panel and we all read the bid and thought it was a good bid, a strong bid, and it, it delivered the essentials. Yeah. What I think maybe we felt was lacking and maybe why the quality scores were a bit lower was it didn't go necessarily above and beyond to be super, uh, to be particularly innovative. But I think that is a reflection of the wider challenges with yeah. this kind of service. Um, and so I would say that is probably the reason why the score was what it what, what it was. Okay, so, so how will you man manage that in the, in the management of this contract, given that, you know, I would guess from the way you described it, innovation and improvement in the service is, is, is quite a big part of what you want them to do over the next few years? Well, it was, well, it, we want them, so we do want them to, we have commitments around being a more digitally enabled service, which will um, move, which will actually allow the service to be more effectively and efficiently delivered. 
most of the areas of innovation that we've tried to push through the specification redesign is around shifting the opening up more capacity for this for school nurses to do their what we would call their typical role or their traditional role which is actually around supporting um teaching school staff the, you know coffee mornings and drop-in sessions with parents who have concerns maybe they've you know they have concerns about the vaccine and they want to have um, a conversation with a trusted healthcare professional or maybe it's um, a young person who doesn't know what perceptions get and they want to have a conversation about what would be the most suitable for them currently because of the burden on school nurses with things like safeguarding and individual healthcare plans which are the essentials they need to be done those other elements of the of the role the traditional role that i just described are getting deprioritized so the innovation is around move um changing ch making changes around that which we've designed into the specification so i wouldn't say that it's necessarily that we want them we've asked for anything specifically yeah. and particularly innovative it's more moving it's around uh, opening more capacity to deliver the essentials and that traditional role that we would see a, a school nurse doing so i think um it's what i said before around the the, the score being a bit lower it was yeah. it, it is about you know going above and beyond something a bit more innovative but like i say i think that's probably a reflection of the wider challenging um workforce situation okay we uh, any other points or questions if we can then move to the recommendation in uh three one let's to agree the order agreed agreed yeah. okay yeah. so move to item thank you very much by the way do yeah. i need to say or should no. <laughs> welcome to you know. <laughs> sorry i didn't mean to <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Same o'clock. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the work that's obviously been put into this. Yeah, thank you very much. So, okay, we move to item eight then. Uh, here on the design and build contractor for development of the next 10 year housing at Franklin Park. That right? Yeah. So, if I can ask, I think Angela Jones to uh, the report. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so just to introduce myself, I'm Angela Jones. Um, hopefully, I'm speaking loudly enough here. Um, but I'm the project manager for Frampton Park in the housing regeneration and delivery team. So this is our request to approve our proposed procurement route for delivering new homes on the Frampton Park estate. Um, I'll talk briefly about the background um, procurement approach and the wider benefits before coming on to the recommendations at the end. So Frampton Park, um, the project is a mixed tenure development which forms part of the council's housing supply programme. It's part of the council's commitment to delivering affordable homes for Hackney residents. You might be aware that in 2021, the Frampton Park estate saw the completion of the first new homes on Frampton Park with the handover of the Reba award-winning Taylor Court, Chateau Court and Wilmot Court, which were built under the council's estate regeneration programme. So the next phase of new homes are due to be delivered on the site of the Frampton Park Community Hall. Um, the site also includes the adjacent cleaning depot structure and garages, and it's expected that up to 55 new homes will be provided on this site. I'll now explain a little bit more about the first phase of this project and why we're taking it forward as proposed in the report. So we originally intended to deliver 69 new homes on the Frampton Park estate, um, of which 51 to, were to be on the site of the Frampton Park Community Hall and 18 were to be on the Tradescant House Garages site a little further along. Um, the council has planning permission for the full scheme, but unfortunately due to cost inflation and regulatory change, changes, and particularly in relation to building safety and sustainability, um, it has become much more challenging to deliver these new homes. As a result, we've done significant work during the last couple of years to improve viability, um, but during this process, it was identified that the planned Tradescant House garages part of the scheme was quite inefficient, um, leading to poor vi financial viability. Unfortunately, in addition to that, um, due to the new regulatory requirements, um, we're, not, we're basically not able to include those new regulatory requirements within the existing building envelope because they require um, a secondary means of escape and we just can't fit it into what has been designed and um, so for that reason that part of the scheme is currently on hold because we decided to prioritize the Frampton Park Community Hall part of the site which delivers the bulk of the new of new homes 
So following additional design work with the architects, the intention is now to deliver um, 55 new homes on the Frampton Park Community Hall site. This will improve the viability of the scheme whilst delivering a policy compliant tenure mix um, with 50% affordable housing um, and 30% social rented homes overall. And we've been during this process, we have kept the ward councillors and the TRA um, up to date in terms of what we're doing. So TRA being of course the Tenants and Residents Association. So the intention is for us to use a two-stage procurement process, which will incorporate a pre-construction services agreement. We believe this is the most appropriate way to deliver these new homes, as engagement with the contractor will allow us to improve buildability um, and secure further cost savings, as well as delivering a financial, financially viable scheme that is compliant with the new regulations. We've undertaken significant soft market testing for the scheme during December 2023 and January 2024, and that supports the approach that we have put forward, particularly because this is a scheme which is over 18 years. Um, so our intention is to submit a non-material amendment and a Section 73 application to planning to take into account the proposed changes to the scheme once we've gone through the initial design review um, as part of the ECSA period. In terms of the finances, the cost of the proposed option is provided in option 2B within the exempt appendix, so we can talk about that a bit later if required. And the council will meet the full development cost of the scheme and will act as the developer for the social rented shared ownership and outright sell homes. In other words, we will sell them ourselves. We won't be doing that via a contract with a developer. In terms of the wider benefits the procurement um, of the procurement, these will include the provision of jobs, training and apprenticeship opportunities for local people, as well as environmental benefits such as improved public realm, new place spaces and a focus on sustainable transport. Um, we'll agree a set of key performance indicators for the project which will cover aspects such as programme, cost, change control, construction quality, health and safety, community engagement and environmental issues. And in terms of the programme, subject to agreement from CPIC to our proposed approach, we anticipate seeking expressions of interest in April this year and issuing the first stage tender in June 2024, see this year. And then going through to appoint a contractor under a pre-construction services agreement this September. Um, the expectation is that the PCSA will sort of go through that following year so that we will be appointing for the second stage, which is the main works, um, in September 2025 with a start on site in October 2025. Um, and just in terms of the recommendations, so briefly, um, obviously we're seeking approval from CPIC in relation to the recommendations that we have set out in Section 3 of the report, um, which in summary is to go out to tender on a two-stage basis with delegated authority to the Group Director for Climate, Homes and Economy to enter into a pre-construction services agreement and, main, and then onto a main works contract with the preferred bidder. We are also asking for delegated authority to appoint a reserve bidder if necessary, um, with this being requested particularly due to continued cost inflation and our need to take a sort of agile approach to ensure best value for the Council. Um, and so that's my sort of summary and just an opportunity, I suppose, for um, the panel to ask any questions. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from members? Councillor Kennedy? Uh, yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's a very good decision uh, to just go for phase one. Uh, but I suppose in, in a way that's that's not part of our remit is it but um, i'm glad i'm glad i'm glad you've done that what is part of our remit is how you then go about doing um uh, just phase one and i think i've the idea of it being a, a two-stage process um and you um i'm looking particularly at 5.32 on page 77 where you talk about um considering the single stage route um and saying and you explain that it's on it be unsuitable because of the additional design work and that seems to make sense um where, when are the circumstances when we would only use one stage because our next item uh, pedro street we're doing a two-stage process again yeah. um so we have um 
CPIC are probably aware, and I, I think I met you actually a few years ago when we previously came to CPIC for this project, which was um, see for the whole project at the time, and for reasons as set out in the report, we haven't been able to move forward in quite the way that we had intended. Um, but where, the, where we have previously, we have done more of the single stage tender process, where we've had sort of more straightforward schemes, and we haven't had the level of complexity that we have now. I mean, we, we've sort of we're at a little, in a little bit of a perfect storm, unfortunately, in terms of um, a sort of intersection of high build cost inflation, which relates to cost of materials, cost of labour, um, but also an increased sort of the a stronger regulatory environment with the introduction of the building safety regulator um, as part of the building safety bill, um, obviously post Grenfell, and the, which obviously was an awful disaster. Um, and you know this is a sort of approach to from the government to try and basically improve the safety of the buildings that we are providing. And of course, there's also the um, climate change part of this and the increased requirements in terms of sustainability so what the two-stage process allows us to do is to work more collaboratively more cra more collaboratively with a build contractor so it gives us the ability to sort of use and harness their knowledge and their access to the supply chains as well um, and it's sort of using the pcsa sort of de-risks that process as well because it means that before we have Gone to the point of entering into a main works contract we can be fairly certain of how much it's going to cost us but also know that we have dealt with you know the design changes that we need to make we've firmed up the tenure changes that we need to make um and that we're able to do that in a way that gives confidence to then appoint them as for the main contract and to be actually a, actually able to deliver these new homes for people yeah and both projects need design change don't yeah. they so so that's yeah. that's entirely understandable. Can I, can, can Sorry, can I? Yeah, it's it's on this because yeah, I was going to raise it later. Actually, on the other one, and I'll, and I'll have to be careful because I'm using the figures from the exempt appendix. But I, I just want to make generally say, and I, and it, because we're a procurement committee, it is of relevance to us. If I've done my maths right, it looks like the the cost of building a new single unit, average single unit, has gone up by 50% about in five to six years. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, is, that is really quite staggering, Chair, and, and sort of affects our whole desire as a local authority to build more um, units and changes the way we have to go about things and then you, uh, as part of it is driven by, quite rightly, new building regulations that aim to make sure a Grenfell Tower can never happen again. And, and that's obviously a good thing. But it, it's not a good thing for our residents in massively overcrowded accommodation um, who desperately want um, a bigger um, council unit for themselves. No, that's right, and that is the challenge that we've that we've been facing. I guess it's it's worth saying it's not just us at Hackney. This is a yeah, national yeah. Um, national crisis. But yes, that I mean the the build costs, as Angela's set out, have gone up um, incredibly, and and there there has been that perfect storm of increased in build costs alongside um, all of the additional regulatory requirements that that we're dealing with. Sorry, I just I wondered what um, exchange there had been. You said you've been sort of in liaison with board councillors and and sort of like, you know local interested parties, residents, and so on. And I'm I'm sure it's in here, but I didn't quite understand that with by going to the two stage, what percentage of social rent would be retaining in that in that first phase. And I suspect you'll have had some pushback around that. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, so in terms of the liaison with the um, TRA and the ward councillors, we have spoken to them broadly about the fact that we are going, we are looking now to go forward only with the um, atrium building, which is the building that's the mixed tenure building that's due to be constructed on the site of the Frampton Park Community Hall. Um, I think we have spoken to the councillors about our intention to use a two stage procurement and the reasons for that. We haven't gone into that level of detail with the residents. Um, I think at the point where we had the pre the previous time we were able to go to the TRA was um, from memory, I think it was September time last year. I don't know if you are um, aware there that the 
at that point the existing TRA stepped down and it's been there's been a little bit there had been a little bit of difficulty I think in reconstituting the new TRA so um, we are now due to go back to the TRA at, for, to the April meeting to update them following obviously the CPIC meeting today um, so but, yeah but in terms of the commitment around but, 50 percent affordable that, that's, that, still that's still the commitment still the commitment yes yeah. of what percentage is that is social rent so that will, it's the policy compliant mix. So it will be. So overall, it will be thirty yeah. percent. So we're talking. About, we're looking at target over the whole program, and not necessarily with the state, aren't we? So the ha it's, I don't know. Do we know what's well? Yeah, it's part of the housing supply program, which aims to deliver fifty percent across the program. Um, and in some instances, we provide more affordable on certain sites and, and less on others and then across the program it's 50 percent on this particular site though we are providing 50 percent on a scheme on a scheme basis yeah just sorry just to um add sorry a, a little bit further to the answer to um mayor woodley's question and um, one of the challenges when we did speak to the um tra and to the ward councillors was the fact that because of the way that we are having to split this site now and not to, and that we've had to put the other part of the scheme on hold and um, we're having to adjust the tenure mix to a ten, a tenure um, to a planning compliant mix within the atrium building itself and um, because the other part of the scheme was holding more of the outright sale units and um, it means actually reducing in terms of actual numbers it means slightly reducing the number of social rented homes within the atrium building i think that has been the most challenging thing for us to put forward to councillors and to the and to the tra um, but we have that was my concern yeah that that is the most challenging part of it politically um, but i suppose from our perspective the you know the the difficulty is that if we if if we don't do that we will be over providing on the social rented homes and whilst of course we would love to be able to provide more social rented homes because that's the entire reason that you know that our team exists the financial viability challenges are still very very real even going through the pcsa period i i don't think that it will be a simple process to get this to a financially viable point but i do think it is a process that will work and um, so we can't really commit to delivering more than the policy compliant amount i suppose that is uh, but it, the yeah. basic position on it it's probably not ideal in that sense it's not easy to go to residents i mean I, I think your presentation here is that, that we have little options so i think it's probably a conversation to take offline in terms of what the implications um you know i understand there's questions around the community hall etc so but not for this room but it'd be interesting from the people yeah. who might rather to get a grip on it so <laughs> we'll take that offline yeah okay that's good um uh, uh, can i just go back to councillor kennedy's question just so so um, why are you seeking delegated authority for the second stage, basically, isn't it? Why do you need delegated authority rather than come back to see it? Okay, so there are a variety of reasons why for this process and um, for this particular procurement we're looking at um, requesting um, the delegated authority. So. Um, in particular, it's because of the, the issues that we have raised already around the sort of challenges of the um, high costs, inflation, cost of materials, cost of labour. Um, and we need to be agile in our response to the market challenges and to be able to respond quickly. Um, this means which this reduces the impact on the programme and reduces the likelihood of delays prior to the start on site. Um, basically, putting in going through the lbh governance we tend to add um probably another 12 weeks sort of delay in terms of entering into the contract um, and our expectation is that contractors would not be able to hold their tender prices for that long so we could find that while we're going through the governance mechanisms and obviously completely understanding that the whole purpose of cpic is to be able to have the oversight and authority on this where looking at this in line with also trying to do the best for the residents and trying desperately to get these homes delivered um, and so i suppose in, it also means that in relation to the delegated authority in terms of the recommendation around the reserved bidder it allows us to keep some level of competitive tension and mm. um, so that it is known if you know if the um contractor knows that 
basically, if you can't come up with the price that we need, we are going to go to somebody else. It does keep that level of tension so that it mitigates the risk of being in a position where they think, oh, well, we've got the PCSA. I'm sure the council will just, you know, will just, you know, take whatever price we give them. And um, so it's it's more about us being able to respond quickly and to the sort of challenges than anything else. Okay. And I'm happy to report back to, to CPIC. And yeah, I, I perhaps just add to that, that the intention is that this would form part of the dashboard from the housing regeneration and delivery service that goes to the capital asset um, steering board right. quarterly as well. So you will have that sort of ongoing um, check, if you like, on, on the progress on this project and, and others. Um, and it will also be something that's picked up within the quarterly housing lead member briefings. Um, well, yeah, mate. I think yeah, just it's worth commenting that, that at some point we'd expect to um, uh, be informed of how you've used that, have used that delegation, either through CPIC or through another arrangement we might have sorted out through the Capital Assets Board. But yeah, very interesting. We'll see how that was exercised. Can I just ask a quick question on the um, the reserve bidder process? I just want is what you could say in public about how how that will work is it if you like run two at once for a while or no the intention isn't to run um two at once but we would be informing the reserve bidder that they are the reserve bidder and then the hope is that we wouldn't actually need to use them at any point and that we would kind of move forward with this scheme with the preferred bidder and we build it out etc but it does mean that we have uh sort of if you like instructed them or appointed them that there may be a possibility that we do need to call on them at, at some point but we wouldn't be expecting to sort of run them in tandem have we used this process before or extensively up to now um we've used the reserve bidder process in the past on a single stage yeah. um tender we this is we haven't done it on a on a two stage yeah. um though my understanding from speaking to our employer's agent on an, on another scheme um but it has been involved in a similar approach with registered providers mm. but it, yeah we, this is the first time that we've, we've done this on a two-stage tender at Hackney. okay well that's another thing we can have, find out when you've done it whether it worked or not it? okay um, I think, oh yeah, there's one other question from me. In the risk on page 80, the finance, where is it? Um, is it page 80? Yeah, got, yeah. Sorry, I'm just searching for things. Yeah, uh, the top one, inability to deliver the project. The potential finance impact of the comp on it on the cost of the contract yeah they're, they're, they're all extremely high and extremely high impact um yeah are we, are we expecting to, well i don't know it, it did look very risky like that it, why are we going to be able to you know the, what looks like high risk to be able to deliver our objectives for instance how would you mitigate this, uh, those if uh, you, you did get a massive increase in the price for instance as yeah as so, it seems highly likely i think I think it's not I, the way that I have um, me measured the risk on here isn't so much about thinking that we are going to get a lot of higher increases. It's more about the fact that our current um, position in terms of the viability is not where it should be in terms of the sort of net present value of the scheme. Um, essentially, we have to we have to save a significant amount through this PCSA process um, and. So I suppose in terms of the risk rating, there I would say there is quite a high risk. That there isn't a way to sugarcoat it, particularly in terms of. Um, we, yeah, I don't know if you want to add something else, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, a bit I guess more the, positive. The, the two-stage tender process, in a way, is our it's way the of mitigating mitigation. The, yeah. the risk because it's working with a contractor to find ways that we can make this building both compliant in a regulatory sense um, but also as efficient as possible um, and we so I think the, the two-stage tender in a sense is part of that but we're, there's also a sort of package of measures that we're looking at so I think it's it's partly it's about cost partly it's about value so there's also a look around optimizing the values of the um, the outright sale homes, for instance, so that we provide a bit more cross subsidy back into the affordable um, units. And I think as well, 
um, it's about grants and subsidies. So it's sort of no, you know, no stone left unturned in terms of trying to explore all of the ways that we can get funding into the scheme. So, for instance, we have sort of live conversations with the GLA at the moment. You know, Woodley will be aware of around sort of um, trying to get increased grant rates, recognising the challenges that we're all facing um, on this and, and also um, looking at things like where there's an opportunity to apply for brownfield land release fund funding to help as well. So it's hopefully, you know, that subsidy will also bring bring us into the... If I went into that, the, the 10 you missed... The Sorry, you to come back. So, sorry, I was just going to add another probably quite important point actually about the way in which I have filled in this yeah. risk um, assessment. Um, so normally when we do our internal risk ratings, we put you know likelihood impacts and overall before we have applied the mitigations, yeah. and then we have the mitigations, and then we have, and then we put in another set. I've actually the way that I have filled this in, which perhaps is not correct, and the, you can correct me if I have done this incorrectly. Um, so what I've put in here is what it would be before we have mitigated any of the risks if that makes sense so it would be a bit lower than that right. it, if we had applied the next section it was maybe just the way that i had interpreted what i was meant to provide here so apologies if that was not ha quite how it was meant to have been done okay that's helpful but the, uh, the questions i've got to ask there is does that mean that the tenure mix, mix is at, at risk if the finances don't work no we've made a commitment to safeguard the social rent Homes. So I think that that is, um, yeah, that is that is the commitment that we will safeguard the social rent homes. So um, we are not anticipating making changes to the tenure mix in terms of reducing the the number of affordable um, within the Frampton Park scheme or the percentage affordable, I should say. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? So if we can move to recommendations three one, which is to Agree the two stage tender process and three two to delegate the authority as we've discussed. Do I have to do that? Okay. Agreed. Thank you very much. So then, thank you very much uh, for an answer to our questions, which I think we've been thoroughly through that one. Uh, and to the and, and on to um, Pedro Street. Uh, and I think Bromwyn, Bromwyn Thomas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that? yeah, yes. so, yeah, yeah. I'm Bromwyn Thomas. I'm um, project manager in the housing delivery team. Um, I think I have to first thank Angela for doing quite a lot of the background on what is essentially a very similar report about a different project, but a very similar approach that we're proposing. The recommendations of like that and a very, very similar, um, if not kind of all but identical. But just as background, um, again, anyone with a long memory will will know that Pedro Street has been to this committee before because it had a it had a contract in place uh sort of coming up for four years ago for construction mm -hmm. yeah. um the background to pedro street is it is part of the house, same housing supply program portfolio um it's currently a project it's down in clopton park it's currently a project that's designed to be 26 homes um entirely for affordable housing uh half and half shared ownership and social rent mm -hmm. The reason that we, well, the kind of backstory to why we find ourselves here is slightly different to Frampton in as much as that the the reason that contract that was signed in 2020 didn't go ahead was because of the extensive land contamination found on site. That then led into a different, that that meant that that contract turned and became a contract where we did a piece of decontamination work um, to ensure that that ground was safe. Um, but the ultimate decision there was that we didn't progress with that same contract because really this inflation was was beginning at that point in kind of through the period of 2021 when that work was going on going ahead so hence that contract was terminated um over a year ago now having done that contamination work so putting that to one side we now find ourselves in a very similar position to the Frampton park scheme that the design that has planning approval doesn't meet the current re revised building regulations. Um, and so there is design work needed and therefore we don't have a set of drawings that enable us to go to that single stage contract, construction contract tender process that you just asked previously. Um, I think because of that, the 
um, PCSA approach is being proposed so that we can take on board the changes needed through and some planning amendments during that period with the fun practice design team um, that will enable us to then understand and develop and work towards a, an achievable contract value in a similar way that Andrew's described. So uh, do people want more background or is that in sure, right. okay. Yeah, I feel like I've given quite a lot. No, of that's quite, uh, yeah. Uh, and, some, sorry. No, that's, that's it. Some of the issues are very similar to the um, ones that you discussed in the last item. Yeah. Any questions or comments on this? No, I think just to, so in order to accommodate the new planning rules, we're basically shortening the building and losing four units. That's our current. So we've done a couple. Probably. Yeah, probably. We've done an internal options appraisal on that, um, but it needs testing by a more, you know, more completely by a technical team. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that's our kind of initial. We've we've <clears throat> discussed that approach internally and also um, kind of a. You know, so it seems to be a sensible approach, and it's an approach that other projects in the portfolio are taking. So it's, um, I don't think this committee will have seen no. her bank yet. No. So, yeah, there's a couple of other projects where we're Good. The same, with the same yeah. kind of issue. Basically, there's a this new threshold that requires two staircases is caught is really causing 18 meters, yes. as, yeah, which is six stories, yeah. Um, but that's kind of, I think, going forward, we're going to see quite a different approach to height that. You either stay below that, or you have to go quite a lot above that to make it worth your while. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of the background to that, yeah. 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 So. Okay. Parts here, most of reactive. No, you haven't had a similar <laughs> challenge. We uh, we've had some really good positive yeah, meetings with Pact and Part TMO recently. Yeah, we, they've been. Um, they're all really chomping at the bit. I think that's the most frustrating. It's the most frustrating project because I think there's a lot of local support for it and yes. it's all affordable housing. Yes. yes. And, exactly. and councillors are like, come on, when are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it has been, yeah, it's, yeah. It really, yeah, it's just a really frustrating situation to find something. Yes. Because there really is, is, as far as I'm aware, and I may be wrong, but as far as I'm aware, there just aren't people that don't want this building to happen. Um, but the local councillors, yeah, we're, um, we keep up with them on a fairly regular basis <clears throat> um, and and they're really supportive of the project mm. yeah, and we we attended um, oh, the, Newham, yeah, the, the, I attended oh, with another officer of the um, Clapton Park um, management organization board meeting last Monday to give them an update on um, some of the new homes program sites which fall within their area as well and Pedro Street so and they, it was very positively received so and we've had a workshop recently to talk to them about how we work with them um, going forward having just delivered Dalton and Mandeville within their area there's obviously lessons learned from that so we've yeah we're sort of building a positive relationship with them. And, and actually the week before that there was a they, the community gangs team had arranged a community event that was well attended so there's quite a lot of work going on in that area with other agencies as well other and other departments okay yeah um, i just wondered it, it, it does seem quite a lot of complexity to this and we uh, are we considering asking that you come back to us after the pcsa stage is that pop, what, what would um, your reaction to that <laughs> so so i think that the issue one is one of timing and that's really why the recommendations have been drafted in the way they have yeah. the delegated authority yeah. because at the end of that pcsa period the uh, effectively the contractor has got a price that they are willing to hold at that point but yeah. they are not willing to hold it for three or four months yeah. whilst um whilst we have meetings whilst we governance processes um, yeah. So that's really the that's the background to that recommendation. I suppose what the, um, the, the chair is saying is that once you get the delegates that we've done, uh, maybe report back at that time just to have clarity that yes, I think yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So I once did, it, yeah. Either the practice this committee or I noticed yeah. possibly So possibly if you can if you can just program it as soon as you get the delegated powers signed off, the following meeting of CFP if you can bring that back for information. Yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. yes. That, so, that's no problem. And I think, and as with Frampton, I think that is an item that will go forward within the housing regeneration and delivery dashboard to, yeah. to CASB 
and it will also be picked up in the quarterly housing lead member briefing as well. So, but yes, absolutely very happy okay, so to come back for information. Thank you. Um, yeah, and as I said, under the last item, we are looking at through CSB and other bodies of what the program governance for all this is anyway. But yeah, if we could, if we could ask you to do that now. Thank you. So, uh, can we then move to the recommendations and agree 3 1 the procurement and the dedicated authority as it sets out there? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Which brings us to that. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really excited to see these, these working out. You know, it's a wall council of one of them. Like, it's not really an interest, is it? But uh, I'm interested to see it go forward. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so, item 10 then general building contract for area survey managers, general exception. And David Lovell, I think, is going to introduce it. David Lovell. Hello, yes, that's oh. me. Uh, so I'm I'm here on behalf of Mr. Rahman, who was the author of this report, but unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, but I work in the commercial team in building maintenance with Mr. Rahman. So this is a report from the director of climate homes and economy. And you'll see in section three, we're requesting approval to award two contracts for the general buildings contract one for the area surveying managers. So that's two contracts, contracts 1A and 1B. Uh, so these contracts are to carry out repairs works orders that are generated by the area surveying managers, which typically are more complex works that need a surveyor to review them, not the simple responsive repairs works and typically of higher values. So in paragraph 2.3, we've just set out that we these contractors are necessary to enable the council to resource the deliver of their building maintenance repairs service obligations. And in procuring them, uh, it would align with the council's strategic objective to improve residents' trust and confidence in the council. Um, so the approval, the, the procurement of these two contractors is part of an overall procurement strategy that was approved at the CPIC meeting of the 11th of April 22, which was to employ four contractors. So two contracts, contracts one and contract two, each with two contractors. So this is contract one for general building works for the area surveying managers, these more complex, higher value jobs. And the subsequent one will be contract two, which is a DLO support contractors, two contractors to deal with less complex responsive repair type works. So this is contract one, just to give you the background of how we, what this contract is. So the procurement approach for all of these contracts, are you having two contractors per contract? was agreed at the meeting of the 11th of April and it's all set out in, in that report and that's noted in section 14 of this report. So if I if I take you to the specific details of this procurement, this is for two contractors, it's a four year plus two two year optional extension, so maximum of eight years. So that's uh, set out on page 127 and it's two contractors the first rent contractor is awarded 60% of the anticipated value. The second contractor is awarded 40% of the anticipated value. So contract 1A is 60%, contract 1B is 40%. And that split will be done by geographical areas uh, for North and South Hackney. And then if you look at paragraph 6.2, we've, we've given the hard numbers on that. So contract 1A at 60% will be 3.6 million per annum. Uh, contract 1B at 40% would two, be 2.4 million per annum, anticipated value of 6 million per annum times the eight years is 48 million plus VAT. So that's the total cost we anticipate. In terms of value for money, um, we're seeking this procurement. We started this procurement because the current long term provider was struggling with the works and deemed to be failing. Uh, in section seven, we've pointed out that bidder A for this procurement, contract 1A, is circa 15 to 20% lower than the cost of the current interim arrangement that we're using. Um, it's 15 to 20% because there's three different categories of works which have been at different percentages, but they all fall within that 15 to 20% range. Uh, and if you look at section 10 on page 140, you can see that the, the range of the the returns that we got were all reasonably close. So we, we're reasonably comfortable that this is a competitive tender, competitive yeah. bids that we're recommending. Uh, in terms of budget, we've just laid out a section 12 that all of these works are anticipated to be funded from existing budget streams. 
And in terms of contract management and performance, that's uh, it's in section 11, 11.1, 11.2. We're saying that we will appoint an LBH contract manager to manage this contract. They'll be holding monthly meetings and the contractors will be monitored against uh, contracted KPIs. And part of that process is in the monthly meetings, we look to consider how we can improve the uh, the performance of the contract. So in, in the report at 11.4, it lists the main KPIs. In fact, there's a suite of uh, 20 KPIs. So uh, eight relate to the general works, responsive repairs type works, uh, and the Annex 18, there's 12 specific to voids. So that, that's a fairly brief overview of the report. Um, I don't know if there are any specific questions relating to that. Thank you very much. So questions or comments? Councillor Kennedy. So the, the contract management side of checking the work, I think if I remember rightly, did I read somewhere you'll, you'll check 10% of the jobs? It, it, yes, it, it's, a, it's a standard statement in our contracts that we will check up to 10% of the works. We will randomly check. And in the KPIs, there is a KPI for that, that we will check up to 10% of the works. Great. And can I just check that all the staff doing that checking will be completely independent of the contractors themselves? Uh, so it'll of, be of the contractors we're employing. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. yes, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I've got one more as well. Sorry. I've, oh, got, a cheap, I've got a cheapy question as well, Chair. Go for it. So, Councillor Kennedy, we're we're cheaping over all the people who are currently doing the work for the non-satisfactory contractor, are we? Oh, that contractor has given us a Chupi list that has become part of the tender documents. Uh, whether Chupi applies or not, we don't make that statement. We say that the con each of the tendering contractors must take their own advice, but they are all on the Chupi list because if Chupi applies, they all have a legal right to have their employment transferred with the undertaking. So, so we don't designate any decision on that ourselves. So if it does apply, have we got a plan to make sure the quality of work improves from the current employer to the new employer? Yes, yeah, so it'd be the same employees but a different management. That, that's kind of the, the normal um, understanding of Chupi that we, we yeah. the people move, but we expect the new provider to have a different management approach. But I see Kane has got a point. Kane, Kane knows how we're going to do that. So you want to come in? Oh, sorry, yeah, someone put their hand up, but it's too small for me to see who it is. It's, it's Kane Roach, the Operations Threat to Property Services. Uh, oh, just, right. just, okay, um, thank you. Just, just going to come in on that question. Thanks, Councillor Kennedy. Um, it, the, the the advice and the position we, we, we have on uh, this particular contract is because we're going from one contract to uh, what will be uh, over contract one and two, four separate um sections of work or lots if you like um then the the advice is that we don't think that Chupi will actually apply um but in in any event we will be relying on the um contract management terms uh, as as david suggested and and uh, outlined in the report um and that quality assurance regime you know managing both the um the quality checks of uh, yeah, at least 10% of the work directly ourselves, as well as expecting the contractors to provide records of uh, job completions and sign-offs as well, um, and, and photographic evidence, and monitoring the uh, KPI performance management through the um, the terms and the KPIs within the contract. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's helpful. Okay. Um, there would be any... Right. Can I just, um, on... The soft, the safe value, and the, the sustainable performance thing. You got you, set out you know, a lot of requirements, but we don't don't appear to have KPIs around those. So, what's the plan to make sure that they're delivered? Uh, yeah, sorry. Could uh, could you repeat that question? I quite understand what you're asking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, around uh, sustainable procurement objectives. 
there's a extensive se session section rather that you don't we don't appear to have uh, KPIs around sustainable procurement you know number of apprentices and all that sort of stuff although you, you have ambitions in those areas so how are we going to ensure that those objectives are delivered in this substantial contract yes so they the the quality submission including those um promises for those uh, you know, made in each of the bids, they become part of the contract documentation. So we would monitor them, but it's not so much we monitor them against performance, we would expect them. So we would, if we don't get them, we'll be asking for them. Um, they're just hard expectations of the contract. So they're all set out somewhere, are they? Yes, yes. Sorry, go ahead. I suppose, I suppose, David, is um, this is something probably you we need to work with the, the procurement center to try and see how we capture the delivery. I think what members are asking is that there are very good stuff there. I uh, know that about that in terms of what the suppliers have promised. I think what, what is important is that we need to work with the procurement team to make sure that we can actually capture them in terms of having specific KPIs against what has been promised. So. I think what will be helpful is that if you are out of this meeting, if you can liaise with the procurement team to try and see how you can work together to get this captured over time. Is that okay? You're happy to do that? Uh, absolutely, yes. I, I mean, we, we will effectively we will lay them out to protect, say this is what you promised, this is what we expect. But by all means, we can liaise with the procurement team to monitor that. Okay, and is it worth us, worth us asking for a note back at some point in the future as to how that has been done? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a report, but yeah, yeah. it would be useful if you could inform yeah, members of the committee yeah. of the outcome of that. Okay? Any other points or questions on this item? So, thank you very, very much for that. That's obviously is really another important contract. Um, and if we could draw members' attention to the recommendations in um, Section 3, it always is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been signed on to, to approve the order of the contracts as set out. Yeah, you do that? Yep. Agreed. Okay. So we move to item 11, the E5 CEDA financial system procurement. I know that is. Um, and mm -hmm. Sabia Malik is going to introduce that. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you. This is my first time at the CPIC committee. So happy to be here. Um, I'm Sabia Malik. I'm the head of ICT uh, Legacy Systems. I'm actually presenting on behalf of Rob Miller, who's a little unwell, so couldn't be here today. Um, your uh, approval is required today. We seek your approval to award a five-year contract uh, to continue the council's current uh, accounting system known as E5. We also call it CEDAR locally um, with the incumbent supplier. Uh, this will be a direct award using the Crown Commercial Service and using the BOSS, the back office software framework, RM6194. Uh, I'll give you a quick summary uh, of, of where we are with this procurement and uh, a little history, if you like, uh, of the software that, uh, that we've had in the Council for several years. Um, the most important point today is the current contract with this supplier expires on the 31st of March. There are no further provisions to extend, so therefore we need a new contract in order to continue the service. This is a critical service for the Council. Um, E5 Cedar has been developed extensively over the past few years, several years in fact, uh, and it provides a complete platform for the financial accounting and management of the Council's finances. Uh, it delivers on the requirements for a Council uh, finance system and it delivers the core modules which is things like accounts receivable where we manage debt where we bill our customers accounts payable where we manage our suppliers and we pay our suppliers the procurement module every all procurement for the council has to go via e5 cedar we've got a fiscal model uh, fiscal module rather which is a detection a pro detection system uh, to ensure we don't have duplicate payments supplies etc all the back payments, all the DD direct debit collections are done through uh, the system. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of points. Um, um, we, we migrated to this present incumbent supplier in 2020-2021. It was a four-year contract. 
Uh, but because of the cyber attack and because of the pandemic, the migration was delayed. So we, we only managed to migrate over uh, in 2021. So it's only now, two slash three years later, that we are realizing the benefits uh, of the present supplier and, and our relationship with them. Um, they provide a very resilient service. It's a secure, robust service. We're at 99.7% of availability. Um, so uh, that we have a direct relationship with them. So this that has been quite positive, uh, a very, very positive experience as compared to the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. We've got a very structured set of KPIs and SLAs. Uh, that we monitor performance, we monitor the provisions uh, uh, as per the last contract as well. In addition, we've got a set of service credits as well, IT service credits, where if the uh, supplier falls short of their availability or performance in the service at all, then we claw back on the monthly hosting charges that we pay to them. Um, so that, that's kind of a brief overview of where we are. I want to highlight one more thing, and that is uh, point 0.5.13, and that is looking to the future, uh, because this contract uh, seeks a five-year, uh, this, this approval seeks a five-year contract, and it is our commitment and intention over the next two years to do a complete discovery exercise, uh, and that is to do a robust review of our internal requirements, our financial requirements, our business requirements, but also to look to see what the market is offering. And that gives us enough time over the next five years. Uh, should we wish to change solutions or should we wish to change suppliers? It gives us that five years because experience and looking at other councils uh, suggests that it is at least a three to four year process of procurement and implementation to change a financial system with upwards of a minimum of three million pounds uh, to implement a new financial system. So bearing that in mind, it gives us the time to do a complete exercise to de-risk our, our options for the future. That, that was my brief summary. I'm very happy to kind of uh, provide any clarifications or take any questions from anyone. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, Councillor Woodley and then Councillor Kennedy. Mayor Woodley. Mayor Woodley. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome to your first CPIC. I always like to kiss the chair. <laughs> um, it's always a bit worrying having a choice of one. I won't. I won't pretend otherwise. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a convincing case. Um, one of the points that you, you made was um, another borough sort of moving to this um, supplier and, and that being sort of reassuring. What I guess we don't know is whether they offered a similarly sort of competitive uh, contract. I mean, I imagine there's commercial sort of, um, but, but I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm wanting a bit of reassurance around, if you like, value for money in terms of continuing. I, I recognise what you're saying in terms of avoiding disruption and, um, but, yeah, but... but generally having an option of one is is not ideal yeah and, and and i think one of the reasons has been is that we've had such a short time in this last contract term uh what would have been four years effectively was less than three years because because of the delayed migration that we really have not had the time to to look outside and even if we did we would need three to four years even even just to move but the reassurance i can give you is that we've been talking to this present uh, to the incumbent supplier for about a year now in preparation for the expiry of the contract and we've managed to negotiate uh, quite um quite a reduction uh in in terms of the rpis uh going forward and also managed to get some social value from them in terms of uh some extra they're going to provide us with 300 extra licenses for education and training for every year of the contract um, so in terms of negotiating and, and, and kind of looking to the future, uh, that's what the next five years is going to give us. Uh, hi, Safia. Thank you. I'm trying to understand why just a straight five rather than, say, five plus one plus one as we start to examine in the future or three plus one plus one plus one or something 
So it, I, I think we were a little bound by the framework. Um, and the, the framework gave us five years. Um, the framework gives us four years, but the supplier has offered us a discount, which equates to about 4.75% if we sign for the five years. But we also felt like five years was a good enough span of time for us to make the internal decisions or the internal reviews should we wish to change it. Uh, so, so five years in that sense gave us the stability that we needed, uh, but also the discount, the little discount that we needed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If I can ask about um, the sustainable procurement, uh, if you do not procure um, I'm going to what you've written in the report. Um, and I know it, it's difficult getting some of these benefits from a contract like this, you know, which they're all remote. It's not delivered from Hackney, is it, effectively? Uh, but um, uh, can you sort of just tell us how, how we go about maximising the sort of benefits we could potentially obtain here? Because we are spending half a million a year with these people in terms yes. of you know, benefits for Hackney. Yeah. Now, I, so, so, sorry, was that a second question? No, no, no. So, uh, benefits for Hackney outside of the direct um, uh, deliverables of the contract itself. So, so um, the one thing we've managed to negotiate with them is for Hackney residents, and this is specifically for Hackney residents, is uh, in point, uh, there it is, social benefits in point 8.5. And this is these extra 300 free places per year that I was talking about that I briefly mentioned. And this is part of the adult learning process, uh, but, but part of the adult learning team uh, to provide English and maths extra uh, classes for 300 places for Hackney residents per, per year of the contract. For five years, they will provide that. So this present supplier already works with, with our teams and, and that's a, a, a service we pay for. This is in addition to that, 300 free extra places. Okay. Um, right. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any other questions or comments? So move to the recommendation and agree to that the contract has uh, stepped out. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't, there's no requirement to exclude the press of the Public, there's no confidential minute, so um, thank you all for your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 8th of April. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you everybody. So, thank all the officers as well for uh, our work that put in on basically preparing the contracts and uh, then answering our questions. Answering our questions. <laughs>